Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce you, Kenny. I'm, I'm Gregory Leck, which we haven't met. I'm a neurosurgeon here uh, and uh, really interested in, in the work that you're doing. And uh, Kenny just recently uh, joined the uh, USC. You came from Seattle, isn't that right? Or Washington area? No, actually, I came from the East Coast. So oh, uh, yes. yeah, spent some time and, at uh, UVA and, and Penn State, Hershey. And uh, I, uh, I understand you've developed a, 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 a already a pretty big practice for uh, what's sometimes called whooshers. Uh, pulsal tendinitis and uh, intracranial stenosis, and that's something obviously that we're all interested in hearing more about. So, uh, thanks for making the time to talk to us. Uh, no, thank you for having me. Well, it's certainly a pleasure to uh, to, to speak to your uh, group. Um, I certainly heard a lot about it. Uh, uh, Johnny Delish, I don't know if you guys remember him, but when I was a resident at Oregon, he he um, had a lot of great things to say about uh, about the house uh, house clinic. So, uh, it's certainly a, an honor to uh, be here. Um, <clears throat> I think what I wanted to do today was to was to uh, try to convince everyone that uh, that maybe we should uh, pay more attention to uh, the veins and particularly uh, the veins of the brain. Um, and uh, you know, it, to me, it was always interesting, or it was always interesting how um, uh, talks like this are often initiated with a title slide such as this. And I always found them kind of boring. So I sort of created um, my own <clears throat> that I thought might be more uh, engaging and, and uh, get people uh, jazzed up on a Friday morning. I don't know if anyone knows who this is, but if they want to put it in the chat, uh, we can certainly talk about it later. Um, <clears throat> do you want to uh, go over some financial disclosures? Uh, I am on the Speaker Bureau for both Stryker and Microvention. Um, I am a consultant for Cook. Um, I also receive research and educational funding from uh, Genentech and, and Penumbra. Uh, none of these uh, financial relationships uh, are pertinent to this talk, but I just had to um, get that out of the way. So I wanted to start off today by, by talking about uh, stroke. And everyone knows about stroke and knows that stroke is a terrible problem. Um, you know, it's going to be predicted in the next uh, uh, several years to uh, uh, more than 1 million Americans uh, per year are going to be affected by some kind of stroke. It's been one of the leading causes of death and disability among adults, at least until uh, COVID-19 um, hit. And if you really look at stroke, um, you know, here we have some scans uh, on top uh, left corner of subarachnoid hemorrhage. Here's an AVM. Here's a, an occluded uh, M1 segment. Um, here's a uh, right temporal ICH. These are all um, arterial problems. Um, and if you look at the neurovascular space, these are all the different toys that I get to play with when I try to uh, help people. You have stents and balloons and, and weird doodads that, uh, that look like this, but these are all problems um, of arteries. And uh, you know, everyone loves to talk about the arteries. If you look at the medical literature overall, if, you, if I, just, I just did a very quick and dirty uh, search in PubMed, 68% um, of the vascular literature is uh, about arteries. And if you sort of focus that in on the head and neck, that number goes up to 83%. Um, but I think uh, we all learned in medical school that there's another set of blood vessels in the body that are not arteries, and those are veins, and they comprise roughly about 50% of the um, blood vessels. So <clears throat> we have a bunch of diseases that are very well characterized. The treatments and indications are, are very well known, uh, but they all deal with arteries. And one of the questions that keeps him uh, up at night uh, fairly late is, um, you know, we have this other population of blood vessels, namely the veins, and are there diseases of the veins that, uh, that uh, we should know about or, and or learn how to treat? <clears throat> and the answer is, of course, yes. Uh, we're very familiar with uh, what, prob what, what can happen when, um, when veins go bad. You know, on the left side here is a, uh, an angiogram of a uh, right transverse uh, dural AV fistula. Uh, and you can see here, um, what this is here is the uh, right transverse signal junction, and um, this is uh, an early arterial injection of the external carotid artery, but we're already seeing uh, retrograde reflux into cortical veins here. So this is a, uh, a very bad problem uh, that can cause terrible symptoms, but also predispose patients uh, for hemorrhage. Uh, you can see here, uh, this is uh, a born type 3 uh, dural AV fistula. 
Um, here is an angiogram of a, a left frontal avian. This was actually a uh, physician that I took care of. She actually presented with uh, symptoms of um, personality uh, derangement and uh, cognitive difficulties. And uh, it wasn't because her avian had ruptured or was creating mass effect or anything like that. It was because of all this tremendous uh, parasitization of the uh, cortical veins by the vascular malformation that, that really uh, um, uh, caused her brain to develop a venous congestive uh, syndrome and, and, uh, and not function as well. So we know that when veins don't work well, we know that uh, patients can have symptoms, they can have very debilitating symptoms, and that once these venous issues, uh, or in this case, arterial issues are corrected, that a lot of their symptoms um, disappear. And so that sort of begs the question, are there other surgically treatable venopathic conditions? And of course, the answer is yes. And, and I sort of wanted to start easy with you guys before we started <clears throat> moving to uh, more fringe type uh, issues. And um, I'm going to start the story with a uh, condition, uh, fairly rare, that you guys may or may know about called pseudotumor cerebri. Um, this was uh, uh, initially described, <clears throat> I think, by Dr. Quinky, who's a neurologist uh, in the late uh, 19th century, <clears throat> early 20th century. Um, but it's gone, uh, uh, it's gone through several um, names uh, since then. Pseudotumor cerebri is the Latin for a fake brain tumor because um, patients would often exhibit signs and symptoms of raised intracranial pressure, but, uh, but upon investigating, there was really, there was uh, no, otherwise no mass uh, or uh, anything that might uh, uh, raise the intracranial pressure. Um, the name was later changed to a benign intracranial hypertension. Um, and I think the, you know, raised intracranial pressure can oftentimes lead to blindness in these patients. So I thought the, I think the word benign is probably not uh, appropriate. And so uh, some of the, I think the, the current um, iteration of this is idiopathic intracranial hypertension, because uh, uh, as, as of yet, we're not exactly sure where, uh, uh, what the etiology of the, of the raised pressure is. And of course, the, a subset of these patients uh, that I par primarily focus on is, is, are those with venous outflow uh, stenosis. So just a brief background, these are predominantly female patients, young female patients, you typically associated with, associated with the higher body mass index. Uh, Walter Dandy in the 40s uh, described uh, a set of criteria um, uh, for uh, diagnosing uh, intracranial hypertension. Um, uh, typically, uh, an opening pressure of 25, uh, an otherwise uh, essentially normal uh, uh, central nervous system. Um, these patients uh, oftentimes uh, uh, present with uh, so what they uh, describe as a balloon in their head, uh, typically bifrontal. Um, a lot of times the word pressure uh, is used. It's typically worse in the morning. Uh, often uh, when patients are recumbent at night, that, that um, raises the pressure. And, and after the brain's been subjected to pressure for six to eight hours uh, upon uh, these headaches, will oftentimes wake them uh, in the morning. Um, intracranial pressure that's not treated can uh, lead to papilledema and subsequent vision loss. Um, and the, uh, the subset of intracranial hypertension patients that I speak about are those with vascular abnormalities. And so uh, with things like venous uh, transverse sinus stenosis, and uh, uh, I would say 80% of the time, these patients will often have a, uh, a unilateral uh, pulse synchronous tidiness. And um, <clears throat> I've, I've been trying to think of better verbiage to sort of describe the noise that they hear. I think a lot of patients will use the word tinnitus or pulsatile tinnitus. I think you guys are very familiar with that there are uh, numerous and uh, various forms of tinnitus that can be pulsatile but may not be synchronous with the cardiac cycle. So this, in, these, in this particular patient population, the, the, uh, the noise, the tinnitus that they hear, the brewery is, is related to uh, aberrant blood flow in the, in the stenotic segment. And so it's typically uh, synchronous with the, uh, with the pulse. <clears throat> Typical workup uh, involves uh, non-invasive imaging. Here is a, uh, uh, is there an, an M a, a sagittal MRI with some of the uh, stigmata of raised intracranial pressure. Um, you can see a uh, what we what is essentially a flattened pituitary gland or an, an, an empty cell instead of a, a little 
uh, marble. This looks like a flattened pancake. Um, the raised intracranial pressure can cause uh, pressure differential a gradient between the intracranial and uh, uh, spinal compartments, and this can lead to uh, movement of, uh, of parts of the brain here, particularly in particular are the uh, cerebellar tonsils that uh, you may have, you can see that they may be descended a little bit or there's some crowding of the foramen magnum. Um, if you look at the eyeballs, uh, you can see a distinct CSF signal within the optic nerve sheaths. Um, <clears throat> and over here on the left, you can actually see the uh, optic disc that's been raised. So this is, uh, this is how you can diagnose papilledema on, uh, on an MRI. <clears throat> um, uh, Non-invasive vascular imaging uh, will oftentimes uh, show a, a synodic segment here. The and for whatever reason, and again, this is one of the questions that we're trying to answer about uh, probably 98% of the time, the, uh, the synodic segment is in the transverse uh, area, the transverse sigmoid uh, junction. Um, I, I never think it's uh, enough to diagnose venous stenosis on non-invasive um, imaging and, uh, or just on, on pictures alone. Here is an an a lateral projection of a, uh, an angiogram of a carotid injection. You can see here the superior sagittal sinus, transverse sinus, the sigmoid sinus, and you can see here there's a a fairly clear area that uh, of caliber change. Um, <clears throat> now, the uh, it's interesting because the the transverse side or the venous sinuses in this area are not they're not round tubular structures. They're actually, these sort of strange uh, triangular uh, tubes, and so two dimensional imaging uh, can sometimes be uh, misleading. So even though this is uh, uh, this appears to be stenotic uh, in every single case. I use uh, physiologic measurements to confirm that there is a, a flow abnormality here, and that's to be done with uh, intravascular manometry. And so what we'll typically do is we'll put a microcatheter uh, distal to the stenosis and then, and then drag the microcatheter uh, through the stenosis to a point proximal to it, and we'll take pressure measurements um, at, at, at various points. And you can see here, uh, Pre, uh, uh, pre stenosis, um, the, the main venous, the main intravascular pressure is, uh, you know, in probably in the in the uh, 30s, about 37. And as we as we drag the microcatheter through the area of stenosis, you can see here the pressure tracing actually falls off fairly precipitously uh, to uh, a point distal to the stenosis. Sorry, proximal to the stenosis in the sigmoid sinus, where uh, not only is the pressure mean uh, intravascular pressure uh, more physiologic, uh, but you can actually see there's a distinct uh, change in the waveform as well. This is a much more venous appearing waveform. This actually uh, looks fairly arterial with, uh, with, a, with a dichrotic notch. Um, and so, so I typically won't offer uh, any kind of intervention until this, uh, this pressure gradient is uh, detected. Um, for pseudotumor itself, there are uh, different um, Paradigms for uh, management, uh, medical management typically involves pain management, uh, weight loss, and uh, and a carbonic anhydrase uh, inhibitor, uh, acetazolamide, to try to uh, take, uh, decrease the pressure in the brain. Um, uh, I'm not interested in medical management as a surgeon, and so uh, for surgical management, obviously there's uh, we can lower the intracranial pressure uh, with uh, CSF diversion uh, in patients who have. Uh, uh, continued papilledema despite uh, decrease a decrease in the intracranial pressure. Um, typically, we'll refer them to ophthalmology for an optic nerve sheath fenestration. And then, of course, for those patients that do qualify for uh, endovascular intervention, um, uh, and these are, of course, my favorite group of patients, um, <clears throat> we can always use a, a stent, place a stent to uh, 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 fix the stenosis. And so here's just some uh, fairly uh, basic radiographs, both pre-stent here on the left and uh, post-stent on the right. You can see the uh, there's a uh, much less uh, difference in, in change in caliber from the transverse to sigmoid uh, sinuses. And if you look carefully, it's, stents are often hard to see. It's the, way we, the way we typically we visualize stents on, on radiography is we look for proximal and distal markers. And so you can see here, there's a, a couple little dots here uh, that signify the the distal end of the stent. Uh, I don't know if it's projecting well on your guys' screens, but you can, you know, you can little, you can see there's a little bit of a weave here. Um, but that's what a, you know, what a stent looks like uh, on the brain. And of course, uh, can't 
always trust your eyeball. So we typically confirm that the uh, pressure gradient that was measured before um, is, uh, is, has been obliterated or is, uh, is much less reduced. Um, for these stenting patients, uh, we've seen, uh, we found that the, uh, for the most part, the papilledema will often resolve after uh, flow is optimized um, because the flow, uh, flow abnormality is no longer there. Their tinnitus typically goes away. Their full synchronous tinnitus goes away. And uh, while we never promise the patients that their headaches will improve, um, uh, about half of their headaches will actually uh, get better. Again, uh, we always like to make ourselves feel better by, by proving that we're actually doing something in the brain. And these are some, uh, I actually never expected this uh, to find this, but uh, these are, this is a, a pre and post uh, stent MRI. This is pre stent on the left, post stent on the right. You can actually see uh, only we you know within a period of uh, less than four weeks that the pituitary gland has uh, reinflated. And, you know, I, I can't, I wasn't able to really. Uh, uh, measure this to make it look real, but e even to the eyeball, it looks like the, the cerebellar tonsils have uh, elevated a little bit and there's less crowding at the foramen magnum. <clears throat> um, so it certainly seems like in patients with pseudotumors cerebri, uh, with uh, venous outflow issues, that stenting makes a lot of uh, sense. We're essentially um, you know, behaving like a plumber, we're fixing fixing a clog, and you know, there's we've been investigating this question for the past uh, decade uh, and a half, which is, you know, is it, we know we can do this, but is it safe? Is it effective? Should it be considered uh, a standard of care for for the for, um, for these patients? So, um, <clears throat> um, I'll just I'm just going to go through some of the uh, literature uh, very very briefly. Um, uh, but uh, I was lucky enough to be one of the first groups to uh, de describe this intervention in a large-ish uh, large uh, uh, cohort of patients. Um, Philippe Albuquerque uh, at the Barrow uh, was the, uh, at the time was the uh, other group that was uh, um, uh, publishing a lot uh, uh, on this. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, that was in the, you know, that was probably only about uh, six years ago that that this kind of stuff was uh, that was going on. Since then, there have been a lot more uh, robust uh, meta-analyses. Uh, one from uh, our group at at, uh, at Virginia, one other one from the Mayo. But this uh, the, the, this idea of using stents to fix veins in the brain has has been picking up um, uh, has been picking up uh, a lot of steam, particularly in the past. Uh, past two years. Um, this is a great uh, uh, meta-analysis out of uh, Australia, uh, looking at the different interventions for patients with uh, with intracranial hypertension. Uh, on the bottom, there's four. You have lumboperitoneal shunting, ventricular peritoneal shunting, optic nerve sheath fenestration, and uh, intravascular stent placement. Um, and these colors, typically the blue color represents uh, patient's uh, improvement uh, in blue, and the red is headache improvement. So you can see this is these are fairly typical numbers that you would see with uh, CSF diversion in intracranial hypertension patients, typically around 50 to uh, 70%. Um, optic nerve sheath fenestration is designed to uh, save vision. So the, to, uh, obviously you would expect the uh, visual improvement to be better. And interestingly, if that's stenting, stenting puts up some very impressive numbers when it comes to um, both improving vision and headaches as well. So I think as, as time goes on, we're seeing a lot more literature supporting uh, the fact that, uh, that uh, that the safety profile of this procedure is is actually very safe, and that it does uh, that it does work. <clears throat> um, this is a, a great case that I always like to show. This is a, a 32 year old female that was actually referred from the neurology service because she um, uh, presented uh, with bilateral six nerve palsies, and so she was seen by her ophthalmologist, sent to neurology, and then they consulted us. Um, she was otherwise uh, neurologically uh, non focal except for uh, maybe a, a moderate uh, a headache, but this is certainly something that uh, has never happened to her before. Uh, you can see here, she's an interesting case as well because her uh, she has a very a fairly uh, normal uh, body mass index. Um, first thing we did was uh, place a pressure monitor, an intracranial pressure monitor, and uh, we were surprised to find that her ICPs were so high, uh, you know, greater than uh, greater than 60. Um, here's a fundoscopic exam uh, showing not only uh, 
visual field deficits, but florid papilledema. Uh, you can see retinal hemorrhages um, here as well. And uh, her uh, ex uh, examination of her extraocular um, uh, muscles shows a very clear um, uh, bilateral uh, sixth nerve um, palsy. This is her angiogram. This is an AP angiogram. So she's looking at the camera. Uh, so this is the sagittal sinus here, transverse sinus, sigmoid sinus. And uh, I think this sort of uh, helps, this picture sort of helps support the idea that sometimes these, visually these stenoses can be difficult to pick up. Um, so you, you don't really see a distinct caliber change. You know, you can see the border of the uh, dural sinuses here and here, and it, it appear pretty consistent throughout. But what, what we do notice is uh, there's a, a decrease in opacity here right at the junction. Uh, so we would characterize this as a, uh, a filling defect. And, um, you know, if you just if you were just do an angiogram, this this uh, uh, might be missed. So again, what we always do is we measure the pressure. We look for pressure, a physiologic intravascular pressure gradient. And in her case, this was greater than fifty. Typically, anything greater than eight to ten is considered uh, an indication for uh, for stent placement. Um, so she got her stent. Uh, and in this case, this was a little unusual because she had a pressure monitor. Um, during the sort of pre, during, and uh, post procedure. So we were actually able to uh, uh, follow her ICPs in uh, real time. And uh, in, uh, interestingly, in, in her case, her ICPs dropped or normalized, I would say, within 60 seconds of, uh, of opening the stent. Uh, you know, I think we were expecting that they might get better in 24 hours, but in, in her case, it really took an extremely short period of time. At three months, um, her fundexophagic exam, uh, papilledema has resolved very, very minimal uh, subclinical uh, visual field uh, deficits. So from a visual standpoint, um, uh, uh, she's much better. And her, uh, most more importantly, um, uh, her uh, nerve palsies have, uh, have resolved as well. <clears throat> um, so this sort of led us to uh, uh, create a, a prospective trial where we looked, uh, where we um, looked at a cohort of patients uh, undergoing stenting for for intracranial hypertension with uh, uh, with an ICP monitor. Um, so these patients, uh, once they were indicated for stenting, they would show up. They would they would get an ICP bolt. Um, they would have their stenting procedure, uh, uh, and uh, and then we would observe them postoperatively, all with uh, all while having a, a bolt in their uh, brain. So um, interestingly. Or perhaps not so interestingly, um, they're, all their ICPs normalized uh, within 24 hours in every single one of these uh, um, patients. Um, a lot of them had symptomatic improvement that was uh, on par with uh, what we see uh, in the literature. <clears throat> and at one year, uh, uh, we, we again, this is on par with uh, what's been reported in a lot of the analyses, but uh, there's a, typically a, a somewhere between 70 and 80 percent sustained improvement in, in headaches. Uh, and vision. Um, with intra whenever intracranial stents are placed, uh, patients have to be on dual antiplatelet therapy. So uh, uh, th that somewhat complicated uh, this uh, this study uh, in the fact that uh, we were drilling holes and sticking wires in the brain with uh, patients on anticoagulation, but uh, but no intracranial bleeding complications were noted. Um, we did have two cases of. Uh, it's called junctional stenosis, uh, or uh, uh, that's not that's not typically stenosis at the site of the stent, but adjacent to the stent um, that uh, we were able to fix very easily with uh, with additional stenting. So, I think, uh, or I hope that uh, you know this very quick run through the uh, literature um, uh, helps uh, support the idea that. Uh, that no, not only is stenting safe and effective, but it can reliably lower uh, ICPs uh, in, uh, in patients with, um, with uh, intracranial hypertension. Um, I'm just going to quickly go through uh, so, uh, some of the more esoteric, esoteric literature uh, regarding this. Um, there have been a lot of studies now, uh, uh, or you know, we have the data, long-term data now that we can use to look at the uh, long-term safety, uh, not only of the procedure, but of the patency of the stents. And uh, this is uh, certainly borne out by the data in, on the arterial side with cardiac stents and carotid stents. Restenosis is, off, is often something that we are concerned about. 
um, in, uh, in the case of venous stents for whatever reason. Uh, I'm sure it's related to the vascular uh, milieu, but the incidence of restenosis is extremely low. Um, uh, certainly when, when stents are placed in, in the dural sinuses, we're oftentimes uh, uh, stenting across uh, uh, other veins that are draining into uh, the dural sinus. Uh, and uh, and uh, we've noted that this does not, this does not um, alter the uh, function or the appearance of these, uh, of these tributary, uh, these uh, tributary veins. Obviously, there's a lot of work going on uh, to try to identify which patients uh, actually benefit from this procedure. Um, there are a certain number of patients that improve, uh, probably on the, on the order of uh, 70%. Uh, some patients improve but recur. And then interestingly, there are patients who fit all the criteria but, but do not experience any uh, improvement. Um, there are also some controversies uh, in, the, in the area. This is a... Uh, 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 there are some uh, patients who uh, uh, exhibit a, a chicken and egg phenomenon where it's unclear whether the dural sinus is the source of the, of the uh, intracranial hypertension. Certainly the, the dural veins are, are, are somewhat pliable and if uh, a patient has a non-vascular etiology for intracranial hypertension, these, these veins are actually compressed. And once these uh, veins are compressed, this leads to a, a feedback loop where uh, the venous congestion develops, the pressure goes up, uh, and, and then the further um, compression on the vein occurs, which uh, of course creates this positive feedback loop. Um, this is an interesting angiogram of the patient. Uh, uh, this is pre, and she's obviously in a lot of discomfort, but you, you can barely make out her transverse sinus and sigmoid sinus here. Um, while she was on the table, uh, we would roll her, quickly rolled her on her side, did a spinal tap, and uh, drained off about 35 cc's of CSF and, and then reshot the venogram. And you can see that her, uh, uh, her transverse sinus uh, now uh, re reappears. Um, if you guys think there's any kind of uh, black magic going on, we confirmed this finding uh, with intravascular ultrasound. So before her spinal tap, this was the uh, luminal caliber of her transverse sinus. And afterwards, you can see that the, 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 the uh, that the area of stenosis has uh, resumed, has uh, uh, gone back to its uh, normal sort of uh, triangular-ish uh, uh, shape. Um, here, here's another study where we looked at how CSF drainage affects uh, intra intravascular pressures. So this is a patient um, undergoing a, a CSF diversion uh, procedure. Uh, we actually have three microcatheters here in her in her brain at, at these points, one sort of distal in the superior sagittal sinus, one pre and one post of one post of the um, uh, stenotic segment, and we sort of uh, uh, simultaneously measured pressures at all these points while uh, the uh, VP shunt um, uh, was placed. And uh, uh, as you can as you can see, um, this this purple line is the actual gradient across the stenosis. So you can see as the CSF is withdrawn, that gradient. Um, goes to zero. So, you know, there's certainly a, a population of, of, uh, of patients who, you know, for all intents and purposes, uh, may look like they have a vascular etiology, but, but certainly, you know, that, that quote unquote vascular etiology, this vascular pressure gradient that we find can certainly be obliterated by uh, VP shunting um, or by, uh, by shunting in general. And uh, we were hoping to uh, uh, use this idea to try to tease out patients who have primary stenosis which causes their hypertension and 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 those patients who have who their vascular stenosis is a uh, secondary um uh, here's a patient uh, we did a similar where we did a similar procedure where the vascular the pressure gradient actually approaches zero but actually never goes to zero so this is this pa in this particular case this patient probably suffered from uh primary stenosis of uh of uh the uh, transverse uh, and sigmoid sinuses um, not everyone, you know, if you go and you start doing non-invasive vascular imaging on patients, uh, not everyone with stenosis um, needs any kind of intervention. Uh, here, here we did, here are a couple studies uh, uh, so, uh, demonstrating that uh, in the general population, uh, somewhere around 37% of patients who actually have dural sinus narrowing that is, uh, that is otherwise asymptomatic. 
and even this, this um, uh, lower study from uh, the Bear Group in Phoenix um, shows that even if you even if you do have a, a, a stenosis, um, uh, only about forty percent of those patients with stenosis on non-invasive vascular imaging will actually be, uh, have uh, a physiologic pressure gradient that that puts them into the uh, puts them into the um, stenting group. Um, a lot of anesthetic considerations. I'm going to try. I'm just going to quickly blow through uh, 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 some of these things. Um, but uh, we're noted we're you know some of the data collection needs to be standardized, and we're noticing that uh, anesthesia can can affect how uh, the numbers that are produced. So it's important to to uh, make sure you do these all uh, uh, in a certain way. As, as I alluded to before, um, stents are very easy to to put in. Um, but we're still trying to figure out why some patients uh, improve. Some people think that um, uh, body mass index is related to uh, poor outcome. Uh, I think we were able to show that, that with those patients with the highest body mass index have the most to uh, earn uh, gain from uh, from these stenting procedures. Um, there's a uh, an interesting phenomenon that I spoke about before called junctional stenosis, where 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 the veins around the uh, initial stent uh, collapse for whatever reason. Um, I think this is a uh, this is sort of the brain's. Uh, it, you know, having seen a fair number of these cases now, this is sort of the brain's way of telling us that stenting was not the uh, was, was not the uh, right choice. And certainly, the more of these we do, the more complications we're going to uh, are going to uh, come up. This is an, an interesting case where a patient developed a uh, a dural arteria venous fistula after about six months after a uh, stent was placed. Again, whether this was related to the procedure or, uh, uh, is, is unclear, but certainly an interesting um, uh, interesting uh, application. Um, a lot of these slides are just uh, demonstrating some of the work that we're doing to try to, again, try to predict which patients are those that will actually benefit from uh, uh, stenting, and we've gone so far as uh, partnering with uh, uh, with some uh, groups across the world uh, to try to uh, mathematically model the um, intravascular uh, uh, the uh, the veins, the arteries in the veins of the uh, of the of the brain, neck, and head, and and um, this is the uh, data that hasn't been published yet, but these are these are some uh, computer models. Um, that have been uh, superimposed upon uh, uh, actual uh, actual uh, in vivo data, and you can uh, I think we're getting much closer to finding answers. But you can see the the the, the model data um, appears to matches up surprisingly well uh, with the uh, with the uh, uh, in vivo data. And this is probably how some of you are feeling. Um, you know, a, a, I know that a lot of that is. Not as interesting, but I think I was going to use this. I was going to sort of transition from this point to uh, talk about some of the other uh, things that uh, uh, might make veins a little bit more interesting uh, to people. So you guys are probably asking me, you know, who who cares about the small population of patient and mathematical models and things like uh, junctional stenosis? So I'm going to kind of extend the the circle of patients that we're uh, I'm going to start to slowly extend, expand the, uh, the circle of patients that we're uh, speaking of. So this is a 44-year-old female uh, with a high BMI uh, who presented with uh, a CSF leak. <clears throat> um, interestingly, she had some of the uh, uh, symptom complex of intracranial hypertension, bifrontal pressure headaches. She did have unilateral uh, pulse synchronous tinnitus. Um, <clears throat> And uh, I like to show this uh, picture because this is probably the only uh, positive uh, cystonogram that the uh, uh, CT cystonogram that I've ever seen. So you can see this is a patient who's had intrathecal gadolinium uh, injected, but you can see here there's uh, extracranial, a collection of extracranial contrast here uh, in the nasal cavity. And the contrast is actually, you can see it's actually here uh, dripping down uh, out of her uh, nostril. Uh, so she's got a positive CSF leak. Um, now, uh, her intracranial dem in Im uh, imaging did demonstrate uh, some of the radiographic stigmata of uh, venous stenosis-related uh, intracranial hypertension. Um, on angiography, she had a very clear pressure gradient. Um, this pressure gradient uh, was obliterated with uh, stent placement. 
and uh, magically her CSF leak went away. Now in reality, it only went away for about uh, uh, three months. Uh, it, did, it did come back, not quite as uh, torrential, uh, but she did uh, have to undergo an endoscopic uh, repair. But I think there are a growing number of us uh, uh, in the neurovention world that think that, that uh, have seen patients who um, uh, keep uh, uh, breaking their uh, their CSF leak repairs uh, because the underlying intracranial hypertension um, uh, hasn't been addressed. Um, this is a, a so-called wisher. This is a 26-year-old female uh, with uh, left-sided uh, pulse synchronous tinnitus. Uh, this is something that you actually hear uh, uh, fairly audibly uh, uh, to those uh, in the room uh, around her. Um, she. It's, it's, you know, to me, it was interesting uh, meeting this group of people. These, uh, I don't, I don't uh, suffer from this kind of tinnitus, but um, it's uh, driven some people very close to the uh, uh, point of suicide. It's this constant noise in their ear. They're uh, uh, unable to sleep, uh, use the phone. Um, it's difficult for them to, to have conversations and to hear. Um, and uh, one of the things that we try to uh, reinforce with our residents is that uh, you know there are certainly a, a number of pathologies that can that can create this kind of uh, symptom complex, and that uh, before we start putting stent and venous stents in everyone, that uh, you look for other things that uh, uh, that that could be uh, causing uh, causing her noise. Uh, in, in this patient's case, again, empty cella. Um, she's got uh, excess CSF signal in her optic nerve sheets here. Uh, so a pretty clear uh, runner for uh, a vascular uh, etiology of, uh, of uh, high pressures. Again, here's an, a non-invasive venogram showing a uh, stenosis here. This was corroborated with uh, uh, invasive uh, imaging showing a 15 millimeter pressure gradient. 15, 15 millimeter mer millimeters of mercury pressure gradient uh, here at the transverse sigmoid junction. Um, she got her stent. And uh, magically, her, uh, her, her pulse synchronous tinnitus uh, was gone uh, immediately when she uh, woke, up from the, uh, woke up from the procedure. <clears throat> I'm going to bring up a couple of other um, uh, uh, at least for at least for me, um, uh, other rare pathologies that we're starting to see a lot uh, more of as, as more people start to pay attention to the uh, veins. Uh, this, is a, this is a patient who uh, uh, presents uh, with a, uh, a type of uh, pulse synchronous tinnitus that I wasn't used to hearing. She sort of described it as, um, uh, you know, a lot of the a lot of the a lot of the tinnitus that patients hear with these uh, venous uh, stenoses are uh, they seem to be much more higher pitched. Certainly not as higher high pitched as, for instance, a, a carotid. Um, uh, stenosis uh, might cause, um, uh, but they certainly, you know, when, when you ask them to kind of uh, mimic the noise, there it's it's uh, it's it, it, it's I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do it, but it, it's 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 a fairly it's a higher it's a higher pitched uh, kind of kind of noise. This patient presented with a which she described as a roaring stenosis, so very kind of low pitched, almost like a a rumble. Um, interestingly, you know, everything whenever she changed position, the quality and, and the volume would change with it, and she could uh, make the noise go away by uh, just putting some gentle pressure on the on the side of her uh, on the side of her neck. Um, this was a uh, this this is was unable to find any uh, radiographs that uh, demonstrated, but what she did have was this little pocket, um, uh, almost a. a, 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 a almost like an aneurysm at the transverse sigmoid junction where it seemed like uh, eddy currents were being created and that's where her uh, noise was coming from. Um, she was actually uh, treated by one of my colleagues uh, in New York uh, with uh, coiling and, uh, a stent, uh, and a stent. Um, she actually did not have any transverse sinus stenosis. It was just this, uh, this little diverticulum, uh, vascular diverticulum that was noted. Um, uh, her uh, tinnitus actually went away temporarily, but but uh, has come back um, with a very different quality. Um, it's it's not a really a tinnitus anymore. It's just uh, she can like, she can hear the sound of her uh, heartbeat um, as if you were as if you uh, put your ear on someone's chest. Uh, 
Uh, but that, that tells it, you know, I don't, I don't think that's related to any sort of vascular disturbance, but the, I'd be curious, curious to hear what your guys' uh, thoughts are on, on something like that. Um, I see, I'm starting to get a lot of uh, uh, patients with sigmoid uh, dehiscence or dehiscence of the sigmoid plate. Um, <clears throat> uh, again, uh, these uh, patients with, with tinnitus that uh, 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 is uh, sort of atypical of, um, of what we typically see in terms of sinus stenosis. And, and on imaging, and certainly on vascular imaging, they're, they're, uh, they don't, their diagnoses of venous stenosis uh, don't bear out, but um, there is some thinning of the, of, of the bone that separates the, uh, the, the, the dural sinuses from the, uh, from the air cells. And uh, I don't know, again, I would be happy to discuss this further with you guys in terms of uh, what, what can be done about, the, about the, this, this patient population. Um, in terms of venous compression syndromes, uh, one of the, my other questions for you guys was whether uh, 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 or what you guys thought of a steroid compression uh, of the uh, of the jugular vein. Here is a lateral CT uh, angiogram, uh, a CT angiogram of a patient who, again, uh, for all intents and purposes, has uh, the symptoms of intracranial hypertension, but uh, has no intracranial uh, venous pathology that, that we could find um, right below the skull base, you could see the jugular vein here that appears to be pinched between the stylate process and the uh, anterior arch of uh, C1. Um, there's been a lot of debate in our field as to what to do with these people, whether this is a real pathologic finding or whether this is just kind of how some people are made. Uh, this uh, male um, uh, underwent a, a styloidectomy uh, and I don't know if I have a, here we go, pre and post-op. You can see here that the, the appearance of the jugular vein um, has, not, has not changed uh, despite removal of the styloid. So uh, whether this patient would benefit from a stent now or whether other and other, something else needs to be uh, looked at, uh, I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on uh, uh, later. But again, these are all fairly rare patient um, uh, populations and, and I'm trying to make the case for uh, for everyone to be excited about veins. So um, I don't know how well I'm doing, but uh, uh, one group that does care, that seems to care about this kind of thing is this uh, uh, government uh, agency called uh, NASA. Um, they, uh, the, uh, they contacted me several years ago because they, they, were, uh, they noticed that some of their astronauts were coming back with, uh, with uh, symptoms that were uh, Fairly similar to pseudotumor, but uh, but not quite. And I asked if we asked if uh, we wanted to uh, collaborate. So there, are, interestingly, a lot of uh, things that are, changes that occur to the uh, human body in microgravity uh, environments, like uh, low, like low Earth orbit. And <clears throat> one of the things, because there's no gravity, uh, we think that that the uh, venous blood flow, our venous drainage of the brain, isn't um, uh, is uh, is altered, uh, and this can lead to uh, this may lead to um, changes or increases in intracranial pressure. Um, uh, I think there's uh, this is I think fairly well known now, but uh, most uh, astronauts uh, that return from low Earth orbit uh, will have some degree of symptomatic uh, visual uh, 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 blurriness, and on fundoscopic exam, a lot of them will have. Uh, some degree of uh, papilledema, and this papilledema will oftentimes resolve. But there are, are a few number of patients, uh, astronauts that, uh, in where their um, <clears throat> their papilledema does not uh, does not get better. Um, the the uh, NASA is taking this very seriously. There's a lot of there are a lot of instruments and doodads on the uh, space station, for instance, that um, allow physicians on the ground to monitor the status of the, uh, of the astronauts' eyeballs. Uh, here's a, a sort of trans, uh, 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 I forget the name of it, but it's like a trans eyeball um, ultrasound. Here are some uh, pictures of it that uh, allows ophthalmologists on the ground on, uh, to uh, monitor the, uh, the presence of uh, palpadema and, and the thickness of the optic nerve sheaths uh, uh, behind the globe. And obviously being able to see very clearly is 
uh, important when you're um, flying spaceships because it appears that there are a lot of little things that you need to be able to uh, uh, see clearly. <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> I'm going to just quickly move on to the last portion of my talk where I, I talk about some of the more bizarre uh, things that we've uh, we found and, and hopefully uh, hit home the point that we should all really care about um, uh, about veins. And this is sort of the area of talk where uh, uh, we sort of go from um, <clears throat> uh, you know the normal world to the to the uh, to the upside down. So uh, here's a an attorney. She's 47 years old who uh, came to see me um, because uh, she. She did have some of these symptoms of uh, pseudotumor, um, but interestingly, when I talked to her, her main complaint was really um, a cognitive difficulty. Um, so she felt like she was developing early onset of dementia. She was having trouble in the courtroom. Um, her primary care physician was worried about uh, early onset Alzheimer's. Um, but she did have these other things, uh, other symptoms, uh, such as, uh, you know, the headaches, the vision loss that, that you don't typically see with Alzheimer's. So she somehow ended up in uh, my lap. We did some imaging. Uh, we did find transverse sinus stenosis. So I sat down with her. I felt like I had a pretty good grasp of uh, what was going on. You know, I was uh, told her that her intracranial pressure was, was, was too high uh, and that if we put a bolt in her, uh, an ICP bolt in her head, measured her pressures, put in the stent to fix her veins that her uh, pressures uh, would uh, uh, would drop. So her angiogram, she had a greedent of eight, which made her, certainly made her a uh, candidate for a stent. Uh, now her ICPs weren't terribly high. They were maybe on the high side of normal, but they certainly weren't uh, typically, you know, in the 20s and 30s that we uh, we normally see. And interestingly, after we placed the stent, uh, her pressure gradient disappeared, which is not unsurprising, but her ICP did not really uh, change at all. It wasn't a statistically significant uh, change. Now, symptomatically, she uh, had a dramatic improvement. Uh, she felt like she was uh, cured of uh, of her of her um, cognitive difficulty. And this this case kind of um, uh, reminds me of some of these other uh, venous congestive uh, pathologies that I showed at the beginning of the case where, um, you know, these patients certainly didn't present with a rupture or anything like that, but this is a, a carpenter actually, who actually um, uh, was bilingual, but lost uh, the use of uh, one of his languages, uh, likely from a, a venous, venous congestive issue. Um, uh, this uh, here is, uh, is that avium I showed from before that was a, a physician, um, you know, presented with some, uh, primarily with cognitive difficulties. Um, again, those cognitive difficulties uh, resolved once we uh, took care of the, uh, uh, the uh, hypertension. Uh, this is a case of a, a young uh, graduate st uh, student uh, from Los Angeles, actually from UCLA, um, who uh, was getting her PhD and um, was finding that in mathematics and was fi finding that she was starting to fail her classes. Um, uh, in addition to some of the, the headache and, and visual difficulties, her, her chief complaint was, was actually one of, uh, uh, was cognitive in nature. And you can see here, she actually had a stenosis in a sort of rare area that we typically don't see, which is the, the sort of the most proximal aspect of the superior sagittal sinus right above the, the, the torcula. Um, her gradient was only three. So certainly a very s low gradient compared to the eight or 10 that we typically like to see. Um, and after a long discussion with her, we went ahead and placed the placed the stent, and um, uh, she's one of these patients that did remarkably well. Um, her her cognition she felt was was almost normal right after you know the night of the uh, procedure, and she actually flew home to Los Angeles the uh, the following day. Um, but this sort of led us to uh, write a re uh, report characterizing the different segments of the uh, sagittal sinus. Okay, we're going to start venturing into the even. More bizarre, this is a patient, uh, uh, I think she, probably late 40s, who um, uh, presented with, uh, her chief complaints were uh, motor in nature. Um, she actually thought she'd had some kind of movement disorder, such as uh, Parkinson's or Huntington's or something like that. She had some very, these very strange dyskinetic uh, movements. Uh, and uh, she had uh, what we thought might be straight sinus stenosis. So we actually, this is actually a catheter in her straight sinus. 
uh, we measured a gradient of 10. Again, her ICP was very, very, fell very well within the normal range. Um, she ended up getting a, lots of stents, but she ended up getting a stent in her straight sinus. Um, and uh, last I spoke to her, her movement disorder appears to have resolved. You know, whether, whether her movement disorder and the stenosis were actually related uh, doesn't quite make sense to me. I can kind of make some stuff up, but uh, I, I still can't really explain why it's putting a stent here uh, can uh, 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 lead to uh, loss of her dyskinetic movements. Uh, but still something that uh, that I'm going to take uh, credit for. Uh, this is a, a soccer player. Uh, she was 17, um, star athlete. Uh, started to uh, notice that uh, uh, she was unable to really use, she sort of over a period of about six months, lost the use of her arms and legs and underwent a lot of cranial and cervical imaging that came back normal. Um, uh, and... Uh, uh, you know, unfortunately for her, um, she went through all this, all these workups uh, that all ended up being normal and um, people eventually, or her physicians eventually landed on a psychogenic uh, diagnosis, uh, which uh, caused her to go into a massive de uh, depression. But her, her mother somehow, again, found me probably on Facebook or something like that. Um, but when we looked at her non-invasive vascular imaging, I noticed that her jugular vein, which is this little sliver right here, um, uh, was, uh, did not appear to be working well on the left, on her contralateral side, the left side, her, her, she actually didn't have a very, she had a very diminutive jugular vein. So, um, and when we did her angiogram, we did pick up a small gradient across this area of narrowing. And you can see actually there's a fairly, uh, uh, profuse demonstration of the, uh, uh, perivertebral, uh, collateral pathways. So I think we sort of put this together as a, venous compression syndrome involving, involving the jugular vein. Uh, and uh, this is a patient that we offered stenting. So here's her stent pre and post. Um, you can see the jugular vein looks a lot healthier afterwards. There is a lot less of some of these vein, pervertebral veins uh, are uh, have decreased in caliber. So we felt like we actually did something uh, physiologically. Uh, but more importantly, for someone who was wheeled, had been wheelchair bound uh, within 24 hours of placing the stent, uh, she was uh, walking independently, and within 48 hours, she was back on a treadmill. Again, can I explain that from a simple uh, five-minute procedure? Uh, I can't, uh, but again, it's something that we we took credit for. So I've, I've shown you a handful of cases that that uh, you know some people have described as uh, 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 you know fairly miraculous. We're fixing things like Alzheimer's movement disorders, uh, we're making people walk again, we're fixing blindness. Um, th these are things that, uh, these are a couple of cases that uh, really did not make any sense to me. And, and I really began to think that maybe these stents were magical uh, in nature. Now the, the experienced among you will, will simply uh, chalk this up to what I describe as the Instagram effect, where is, which is where I've chosen the best uh, results from my uh, case series and, and presented those uh, in an attempt to convince everyone. But uh, in, in reality, this is something that we've been, or I've been looking into for uh, for uh, past couple of years now. <clears throat> so here's our recent experience. So this is a cohort of uh, over 200 patients. These are patients who are not in the intracranial hypertension cohort. So these are patients who, for whatever reason, did not uh, have the, uh, the numbers to uh, qualify for uh, uh, stenting, um, and, uh, and, and many of them, many of them actually had a symptom complex that was, uh, uh, fairly different from what we might see with the typical pseudotumor patients. Um, now what I, what I want everyone to kind of keep in mind is that these are also very rare or sorry, very strange, uh, people. These are patients who have some kind of hypermobility syndrome, which I believe somehow plays into this, uh, into this, uh, phenomenon. Uh, many of them have had a, some kind of Chiari uh, diagnosis. Um, again, a lot of them had headaches, but all of them had some kind of uh, cognitive uh, dysfunction, this brain fog um, that they that they describe. Um, catherangiography in patients with uh, with connective tissue disorders or hypermobility issues, I think, can make some people nervous. But we were able to achieve, I think, a very 
uh, favorable safety profile. Um, we ended up treating 189 of these patients uh, with a little over uh, 300 stents. And uh, the initial uh, analysis shows that the um, that, there, that these patients, that a lot of these patients had an improvement in their, uh, in their, in their cognition. Um, headaches, again, aren't something we try to fix with stents, um, but uh, half of them did get better. Um, and not everyone uh, remained uh, uh, better or improved from the stent. Some of these patients ended up needing uh, some kind of CSF diversion to, to, uh, to improve. Now, what I'm trying to get at is, is the the biggest thing in these in these patients were their uh, the biggest complaint was their cognition, and uh, they they tended to be vague. They tend to be global global uh, cognitive or neurologic issues. They tend to be progressive, and uh, they uh, tended to improve with either alpha venous alpha optimization or or CSF drainage. And I've put a list here of some of these symptoms that they uh, would often describe. <clears throat> But I just tricked you because this is actually a list of uh, what you get when you Google what does early Alzheimer's look like. So, so I, f I felt like there was a there's a very there's, there seemed to be uh, a, a striking similarity between these patients and and who were all who all tended to be you know less than forty to patients with uh, who've been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And just real quickly to tie up the talk. Um, uh, I've, I've been trying to find a, an explanation to kind of tie all this together. And, uh, you know, we know that there are neurochemical dimensions like Parkinson's and, and Huntington's that, that uh, appear to be related to disturbances in neurotransmitter levels. Um, there are conditions of uh, dementia that can be related to CSF, uh, we, we think. And there's a certain third circle here, blood. You know, can cognitive issues arise from blood uh, abnormalities? And of course, the answer is is yes. There's a lot of literature showing, on the arterial side, that uh, that poor arterial input can predispose or uh, lead to a decrease in cognitive ability. Uh, there's some um, nascent literature now in the uh, uh, suggesting that uh, there's a similar issue when the vein when your veins don't work, um, and uh, certainly. Uh, in my experience, also when you uh, uh, fix patients with uh, fix their venous abnormalities, that they can have a significant improvement in uh, cognition as well. So what's at the what sits at the center of these uh, circles, and I think it's this this thing called the glymphatic pathway. So this is a a new theory that's been uh, put out uh, in the last uh, uh, let's see, it's uh, probably about uh, six years now. That that uh, describes a system. Uh, essentially a, a lymphatic system of the brain that uh, th uh, this system describes the, the bulk flow of uh, cerebrospinal fluid through the brain parenchyma. We've all kind of known that they, it, the spinal fluid kind of circulates around the brain, but this is a system where the, the CSF is actually pushed uh, through the brain. How's it? It's a um, And you can see here, here are some uh, fluorescent markers that uh, have been injected via needle into a rodent brain. You can see that the over time that the of course, a marker actually moves, uh, and you might say, "Well, maybe that's just a fusion." But if you if you um, if you follow it out, the, the markers actually all end up collecting in the uh, uh, in the veins or around the veins at some point. <clears throat> um, this appears to be uh, an aquaporin four aquaporin four uh, mediated uh, phenomenon when when the uh, when mice with the aquaporin channel. Uh, when they have that gene knocked out, their ability to move this uh, this tracer is uh, significant, significantly uh, diminished. Um, and uh, the the other thing that to understand about this pathway is that it's uh, the it's actually the pulsation of the arteries that pushes the spinal fluid through the uh, brain, uh, and then it collects in the vein. So it's it's really this uh, this complex system that's. Uh, um, uh, uh, collaboration of all of the arteries of the veins and the uh, uh, and the CSF and and uh, my last point is that the 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 system appears to be most active uh, during sleep. So if if you've ever wondered why sleep is important or why mammals spend a third of their entire lifetimes in a completely vulnerable state, it's it could be why. Uh, it, it, the reason might be that it's how the uh, brain uh, cleans itself and uh, and 
uh, it remains uh, uh, functional. So I started this talk off stating that stroke is a bad problem. Certainly 1 million Americans a year. You know, if you sort of look at the arteriopathies, right, the pathologies are very well defined, the treatments are very well characterized. Uh, the, on the vein side, it's certainly not as clear. You know, we have these rare populations of patients with pseudotumor cerebri. You know, we have patients with CSF leaks or pulse and tinnitus. We have maybe astronauts might benefit from uh, some kind of venous outflow optimization. Uh, but certainly this, there's certainly not, no reason to get excited about veins, you know, especially from uh, a business standpoint. But if you kind of start to expand the indications, you know, in addition to the, the pseudotumors and the, the tinnitus and the, the CSF leaks, um, you know, if you start to try to lump in things uh, that have oftentimes been associated with the venous outflow uh, issues, such as, you know, multiple sclerosis, uh, a lot of the dementias, uh, and who knows, you know, there's now uh, one of the things that I'm looking at now that I really don't want to publicize is, is that there may be a connection between venous outflow uh, issues and, and uh, myalgic encephalitis, or what's more commonly known as chronic fatigue syndrome. And we know that, uh, all know that there are many, many, many patients out there with harboring that, that diagnosis that, that physicians don't want to touch. So I, I'm, I'm hoping that this talk has uh, convinced you that a lot more investigation needs to be done into um, venous pathology and that there may be a tremendously large population of patients that could benefit from uh, from our help.